For more than half a century, confusion and misinformation have obscured the Catholic Church's true role in World War II. To shed light on the Church's covert anti-Nazi activities during World War II, as well as its efforts to combat the nightmare of the Holocaust, the Vatican began releasing wartime documents in 2003. I'm Carolyn Morrison. Welcome to another episode of Mysteries of the Church. Join me as we examine the largely unknown effort of the Catholic Church to thwart the Nazi war machine as it spread death and destruction across Europe. It's important to remember that the Vatican City State is actually located inside the city of Rome, and the city of Rome uh, is the capital of the Italian Republic. It's the smallest uh, sovereign nation in the world, and in many respects it is completely dependent for many of its services and for many of the material needs that it has on the surrounding city of Rome and on the surrounding Italian state. One of the things that's so amazing is the whole history of the Papal States. After around 1871, when Italy forms as a country, the Vatican begins to lose more and more of its territory till basically it becomes this small little city-state within the city of Rome. It's hard to say whether the rise of Mussolini to power or the, uh, the rise of fascism in Italy had anything directly concerned, at least at first, with the condition of the church. The Vatican strove very, very mightily to maintain a position of international neutrality so as to maintain the kind of impartiality that would make it possible for the church to continue its work. When Benito Mussolini takes over, we begin to see someone that is a fascist come to power. He looks at the, the Vatican and he just sees it as, you're off to the side. By the time of the 1920s, with the Lateran Treaties, we begin to see that the Vatican's influence in terms of its geographic region is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So basically it's St. Peter's Basilica and some extraterritorial property. Mussolini, uh, the Italian government actually, signed a concordat with the Holy See that guaranteed the sovereignty of the Vatican city-state, but it didn't, uh, it didn't do anything to keep the condition of the Vatican city-state from being very, very precarious. As you know, the Vatican city-state uh, has hardly any uh, armed forces to speak of, and therefore had the fascist state decided to take military action against the Vatican, um, there would have been no way for the Vatican to resist and defend itself. The concept of a political concordat with the Vatican state was not new. It was a way in which uh, governments in those days did business with the Vatican. And oftentimes those concordances protected the churches in those respective countries. At the time that it's happening, sometimes these things might look favorable. But as history goes on, and then looking back at it, you say, well, maybe this wasn't the best of situations. I think that it made uh, the Pope the prisoner of the Vatican, as has been said by many authors, and the Pope himself. In some ways, I think uh, Mussolini, the fascist, silenced the church in some way. By the end of the 1920s, the Lateran Treaty had guaranteed that Vatican City was safe from Mussolini's fascists. 
But what would happen when the church found itself confronted by Adolf Hitler? We'll find out in just a minute when Mysteries of the Church continues. In the decades since World War II, both Pius XI and Pius XII have been criticized for not doing enough to confront the Nazi slaughter of millions of Jews, Catholics, and other ethnic, social, and political groups in every country overrun by Nazi troops. But what options were really open to the Vatican when the Nazis came to power in Germany? And what was the real course of events in the church's efforts to combat this organized mass murder on a scale never before seen in human history? It became clear when Hitler rose to power and with him National Socialism rose to power in Germany that this was an ideology that was utterly opposed to the understanding of the dignity of the human person and to the sovereignty of God that was key to the church's teaching. When we look at Pope Pius XI and his involvement, and later on Pope Pius XII, and their relationship with National Socialism and Nazism and Hitler, we can see that there's never approval there's never this tacit approval of everything is perfectly fine, we're not going to say anything. But for the good the Vatican is doing, there's only so much they can say publicly. Pius XI issues his, with burning concern, which was a letter, a pastoral letter, stating that these racial politics are wrong. He comes out and he condemns that thinking is very dangerous. And then this begins to raise the conscience of many people. Now, it's no longer just a matter of rebuilding a country. It's a matter of blaming a group of people for the reason why Germany is in the situation that it is in. It's very clear from what we know of Hitler's response to Pius XI's encyclical of 1937 with Mit Brennen der Sorge, that he understood it as an attack that was being directly leveled against the National Socialist Party and against its agenda in Germany. And he vowed revenge against the church. And there were immediate reprisals. The Catholic printing houses that had volunteered to print hundreds and thousands of copies of the encyclical were shuttered. There were arrests of priests there were public trials that sought to humiliate the clergy and the religious of Germany. It was very, very clear from the reaction of the German state security uh, authorities that this was understood as a direct attack against what the National Socialist Movement was doing in Germany. You're dealing with a very difficult regime. You either oppose it directly and face the possibility of, of losing everything, or you say we need to protect ourselves as the best we can in order to be able to do at least something. With the death of Pius XI, it is almost as though Pius XI presciently knew who his successor to the throne of Peter might be. Eugenio Pacelli, Pope Pius XII, was a highly intelligent man. He knew what he was getting into, but the situation deteriorates so quickly during this time period. When he takes over, we quite soon after have the overt invasion of Poland. And we see the situation in Europe growing more and more and more, where it is now on the brink of, of, of war, and indeed quickly turns into a world war. You had war. You had people being killed who were combatant people and you had civilizations being moved and you had all that upheaval, but to put people in concentration camps and kill them, that was genocide. That was something very unique to, to that war. Pius XII is a diplomat, and that diplomacy in his career was the way in which he was trained to deal with situations. I think the church is not silent. I think it is working in the background 
to help alleviate situations where it could. Among those, those situations is it goes directly to the people of the time who are suffering from the effects of the war. The question of the ways in which Pius XII did or did not condemn the actions of the Nazis has been the subject of significant controversy from his own time up until the present. Um, and this, in a certain measure, he experienced frustration at the ways in which people were expecting him either to act or not to act. It's very interesting that there is also no record to date that Pius XII or the Vatican actually stopped the church from aiding and helping people. Yes, the Pope is very important, but the church is, 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 is functioning, you see, the, uh, under difficult situations. But sometimes the church has had to resist evil by doing it silently and by helping these people, by encouraging what is going on behind these closed doors in these religious houses, by making statements very clearly but very carefully. So this idea is that the Pope had good relationships with many countries and many of those countries where Jewish people and other persecuted people sort of quietly were moved to. These places were areas where there were great relationships going on between the papal diplomats and these local diplomats. And it's really, again, an example of sometimes how you can get by and do more by not making a big, huge, in-your-face fight. It's in fact very true that when the German army uh, occupied Rome um, after the armistice with the uh, Italian government and the, the German army directly occupied Rome and directly took charge of uh, the Holy City, the Holy See was very much involved with the various religious communities, with the various convents, with the various monasteries that existed throughout the city of Rome and took an active role in sheltering and protecting uh, the Jews of Rome and Jews who had found their way to Rome from elsewhere in Europe to protecting them from being arrested and deported by the Nazis. One of the things that does occur is that so many Jewish people are taken out of the country. They're given visas. They're given, at times, even false baptismal certificates hidden away in friaries, in convents, until we can get them out of Europe to places like America. So many, many, many Jewish people, people that were considered the undesirables uh, as far as the Nazis were concerned, were rescued and helped by the Catholic Church. And the only way that they were able to do that really was by doing it quietly, quickly, and without drawing the attentions or without drawing the authorities into it. Jews were being sheltered in convents. Jews were being sheltered in parishes. Jews were being sheltered in the homes of Catholic Christians throughout Europe at great personal risk to themselves because when they were discovered, they too were arrested. They too were deported to the camps. They too were killed. Through the combined efforts of the papacy, clergy and civilians, the Catholic Church managed to save nearly three quarters of a million Jews from almost certain death. We have learned how the Holy See encouraged this activity, but how did church officials scattered across the globe implement these secret directives? We'll find out in the next segment of Mysteries of the Church. Pope Pius XII's efforts to rescue innocent civilians from the Nazi Holocaust saved the lives of more than three quarters of a million Jews. Only the fear of eliciting even worse atrocities prevented him from actively speaking publicly against Hitler and the Nazi party. But his inability to provide a public face for the church's resistant movement 
did not prevent Pope Pius from encouraging church officials to do everything they could to aid and support the people of all faiths. Working against the Nazis was always life-threatening, but Europe's Christians were up to the challenge. During the Second World War, Archbishop Angelo Roncalli was apostolic delegate to Turkey and to Greece. Now, as apostolic delegate, this meant that there were no formal diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Turkey, and in his capacity as apostolic delegate, it was his responsibility principally to be the liaison between the local church in Turkey and the Holy See. He sees what is going on from Bulgaria, from Romania, where Jews are being deported. What he does is he resists this by helping these, uh, these people, issuing these false documents, passports, baptismal certificates. Basically, this was his resistance. Officially speaking, Turkey was a neutral country during the Second World War. But this not, did not prevent the apostolic delegation, and this did not prevent Roncalli, who had a long history of being a papal envoy in Eastern Europe, from relying on his network of professional contacts from relying on his network of relationships throughout Europe to exert influence on behalf of those whom he was quickly uh, coming to recognize were being oppressed by the Nazis in those countries where the Nazis uh, had become the occupying power and in those countries where they had installed puppet regimes that uh, were uh, doing the will of the Reich, as it were. So it's very clear from what we know about Roncalli's contacts uh, during the Second World War that he was often in contact with Jewish leaders. And these Jewish leaders made him aware, sometimes even to the point of tears, of the situation that was being suffered by the Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. When you are faced with such a situation, Sometimes you have to do extraordinary things. You strive to protect the lives of the people you can protect. It's widely known that uh, Roncalli, together with others in Europe, collaborated in the fabrication uh, of forged baptismal records that would hopefully provide safety uh, for those Jews in whose names those baptismal records had been Crafted. We begin to see that suddenly these papers appear. Papers that declare these Jewish people, for instance, not to be Jewish, but indeed to be Christian. It's not so much a question of lying as it is a question of equivocating. And he did everything that he could to obtain falsified papers, to make it possible for Jews to obtain safe passage out of occupied territories. So for Roncalli to do that, he, he's courageous, and he's also doing it in a way that it's very on his level, that he could do the best he can with what he has. He is a Vatican official. He is operating in the name of the Vatican at this time. He is not stopped for doing this. He is doing what he could on the local level to resist what is in front of him, you see. And so the church is acting. It's acting in and through its people. It's no accident then that Roncalli, when he's elected to become the successor of Pius XII, when he takes the name of John XXIII, becomes a pope who, as a result of his painful experience, as a result of his having been attentive to the pain of suffering Jews during the Second World War, becomes a pope of peace, becomes a pope who is a champion of human rights. He did not forget the painful lessons of the Second World War. He did not forget the outcry for justice that he heard from his position as apostolic delegate in Turkey. So these feelings that he was a spearhead for changing so many of the stance of the, of the church in so many different directions, that perhaps that council itself 
It was a reaction in the aftermath of the, the terrible things that Europe had, had experienced, or I would say the world had experienced in those five years. We have now seen how three popes each worked in their own way against the Nazi terror. But heroism is not just for popes. Join us for the next segment when we discover how very ordinary people can do extraordinary things under extreme conditions. So far, we have looked at some of the major figures in the Catholic Church who played an important role in combating the Nazi threat during World War II. But there were thousands of lesser-known individuals who struggled and fought against the threat to civilization and Christianity posed by Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. It is only fitting that we remember at least a few of the ordinary people who were led to great acts of faith by extraordinary circumstances. Maximilian Kolbe was, was a, Polish, a Polish conventual Franciscan. He operates a school. He finds uh, a society of, of the militia of Mary, which does things with kids and, and all, all of these things. We find Maximilian Kolbe's ministry becoming quickly a ministry of media. He was someone who was involved in the media. He was a radio announcer. He was a uh, newspaper writer and editor it, within the Catholic press, the Catholic media. And so what he winds up doing is he begins to actively, through the media, through his sermons, he begins to publicly protest against Nazism. Besides this and behind the scenes, Maximilian Kolbe was very clearly involved in work to shelter Jews from the Nazi occupying forces. And it's clear from what we, what we know of Maximilian Kolbe that he was responsible for sheltering several thousand Jews. Well, you couldn't do that for very long and escape the scrutiny of the Nazi authorities. And so Maximilian Kolbe was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. And while in the concentration camp, he did everything in his power to continue to provide spiritual care to his fellow prisoners. One night, we have a situation where one of the people in, the, in that death camp tried to escape, one of the prisoners. In order to make the point you don't escape, the commandant of the camp calls Maximilian Colby and all the other prisoners together and says, because one of you has to go and try to escape, 10 of you will die. Maximilian Colby responded to the outcry of someone who was a complete stranger to him, a man who cried out in anguish because of the fact that he was a family man, a man with, with a wife and with children who desperately wanted to survive, who desperately wanted to be returned to them. Colby goes to the authorities and places himself in place of this man because he has very little to lose. And he dies of starvation and then from a lethal injection in a cell in Auschwitz. He dies a terrible and barbaric death. Saint Maximilian Kolber, we know his name. We know his story. Sad to say we don't know the many thousands of other stories of priests, of sisters, of laywomen, of laymen who gave their lives to save others during the Second World War. When we look into the history of World War II and we begin to examine what the church did, often the focus is put on what the church didn't do. When we look to this history, we'll begin to see that although some people say the church was hiding within uh, the Vatican walls, people were not uh, doing enough. It's precisely those Vatican walls that helped shelter people and bring so many people who would have suffered, so many people who would have gone and just been killed, it helped bring them to safety. The benefit of hindsight is that one can be more conscious 
in an objective way of what the possibilities actually were. I think the church did the best it could with what it had and what it knew. Will it forever be examining its conscience on could we have done more? Did we do enough? I think that's going to be an historical question. My feeling and my belief is that when that is done, the church will have nothing to be afraid of and nothing to be ashamed of. The Catholic Church helped save so many defenseless, innocent victims of tyranny, defenseless, innocent victims of intolerance, of injustice, and had it not been for the Catholic Church, those horrific numbers that are out there would have been doubled. So we have a lot to be grateful for, for the work of Pius XI, Pius XII, and John XXIII later on. And we need to see that, could we have done more? Of course, we could always do more in the face of injustice. Of the many words of gratitude offered to the Catholic Church for its stand against Nazi tyranny, one of the most impressive statements came from no less than Albert Einstein, who escaped the Nazis and fled to America in 1933. In the 1940 issue of Time magazine, Dr. Einstein wrote, when the revolution came in Germany, the universities immediately were silent. The newspapers, like the universities, were silent in a few short weeks. Only the church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing truth. I'm your host, Carolyn Morrison, inviting you to join us again next time for another episode of Mysteries of the Church.